good worship. Yeah. Praise God. My, uh, my wife Mary, when we went to three services, it was probably, I guess, three almost four years ago, but we went to three services. We did that for a couple weeks and she came up to me and uh, got kind of quiet. She said, hey, hey, Bill, I love you. And whenever she says, I love you, I know something's coming. She said, hey, Bill, I love you, but she said, I can't, I just can't sit through three of your sermons. <laughs> and I said, I understand. So she said, I'll, I'll do two a weekend, and sometimes, like tonight, she's not here, she'll take a Saturday night. She says, I can do two, but I'm not going to do three. I said, that's fine. I, I certainly understand it. We don't expect you to do, do three. I got over it. But, uh, <laughs> when she's here, she's always here for all three worships. Never misses. And the same with me. I hear uh, worship songs, which are usually the same, all three services. And you know, I never get tired of it. It's because we were created not to hear sermons, although I appreciate that you guys listen to the sermons. But we were created to worship a holy God. And that's why it never gets set up, never gets old. So I want to thank Tom, the worship team. You guys did a great job. I just really enjoy worshiping here. It's great. Well, let's pray. We're going to continue here. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that uh, you're a God who calls us to, to worship you. Just be amongst us, Father. Be present today. And we welcome your presence. We acknowledge your presence. We expect your presence here tonight. Amen. Well, we're continuing part two of the sermon series on the mission, vision, and values of, of Quest. And today we want to talk about the journey. And it's pretty appropriate that we're talking about a journey today because, as we announced earlier, about 40 Questers are going to make the journey up to, to Indian Lake to plant a new campus there. So we're excited about that. Um, just want to talk, before we talk about mission, we just want to review a few things about our vision and values, and we'll be talking about those in upcoming weeks. Our vision is we seek to glorify God by being a Christ-centered church that loves and serves others through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And our uh, values, uh, it, it forms the acrostic Patrick, P-A-T-R-I-C, you'll see that. The P is for powerful prayer, we believe in that. We believe in authentic relationships. We believe in transforming grace. In fact, we're going to talk about, uh, you're going to hear about transforming grace next week. Radical generosity, intentional hospitality, and creative outreach. So those are our six core values of what we think God is calling us to do as a church in our community and world. Our mission then, we talked about this last week. Remember I said it would have been a long sermon. I was going to break the mission statement up into two points so we wouldn't be here for an hour and a half. But the beginning of it, we, what we talked about last week was uh, meeting people where they are. And the second part is traveling with them to where Jesus is leading and it's that second part that I want to talk about today. And I think if you have the first part, but you don't have the second part, then you don't have much power and usefulness as a church. Traveling with them to where Jesus is leading them. Specifically, we want to start by talking about traveling with them. And who is them? Them is everybody. It's people outside the church, people inside the church. It's all of us together. And we want to travel together where we feel that Jesus is leading us. See, point number one is this. We are all on a journey. Everyone here is on a journey. And that journey culminates, if we allow it, and if we choose so, it culminates in not only giving our life to Christ, but then choosing a, a life of lifelong service to Christ. That's what our journey is all about. We're all on different stages of the journey. In fact, we're like moving targets because where we were on our journey a month ago or six months ago or a year ago, maybe even a day ago, might not there be where we are today. But we're all on a journey. And I say that because I think it's important we all understand everyone belongs here. Everyone belongs here, whether you've been a Christian a day, a week, or a month. Maybe you're not even a Christian yet. You're just seeking out the claims of Christ. You belong here because we are all on this journey together. And that's why we call our church Quest Church, because we want to acknowledge that we are all on this journey. Point number two is this. Our journeys are never over. Our journeys are never over. They always continue, and even uh, we're going to talk about some of those things, but our journey never ends. And we look, can look at, look, look at it one or two ways. We can say, oh, my journey's never over. What else is new? And I can't have to keep doing this. Or we can say this, our journeys are never over. 
There's new things that God has in store for me that he didn't have in store for me today, that he has in store for me tomorrow and all the rest of my days, and that excites me. And personally, I choose the latter. I choose to look at like my, my journey's not over, and uh, God's not done with me. And I say that to Mary sometimes when she gets aggravated with me and, you know, I blow something or make a mistake. You know, I'll say this to her. I'll say, you know, hang in there. God's not done with me. Right? I said that to her over and I've told you what she says to me, or thanks probably. I wish he'd speed up with you a little bit, Bill. But uh, God, God's not done with any of us. See, Jesus is always leading. He never stops. He's always leading. And the problem is that we're not always following. Okay? If you feel removed from God, it's not God that's moved. Jesus is always wanting to lead us. And it's not like we have to sense him or feel him in our... It's based on God's truth that he's always there. And sometimes I feel close to Jesus. Other times I don't. But my feelings have nothing to do with my journey. The fact is, Jesus said he'd always be with us. So the problem is that we're not always following, or we aren't following the way he is leading. We want to follow him in our paths instead of him, the way he wants to lead us. Even Jesus himself uh, grew. Now, he was, he was perfect. He never sinned. But Luke 2.52 says this. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So he grew in life, but he also grew in wisdom. Okay? He never sinned, but he continued to grow in wisdom. God wasn't done with Jesus Christ. And I think one of the reasons that Jesus didn't start his earthly ministry until he was 30 is God wanted to mature him in a way that he would allow him to serve the way God wanted. So Jesus was was not done growing for quite some time. He grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. God didn't love him anymore as he grew in wisdom and stature. He, that didn't have anything to do with it. But he grew in God's favor. The order that Jesus got, the more God approved of what he was doing until finally when he was 30 years old, he was unleashed to do his ministry here on this earth. Yeah, our journeys are never over. And I'm just talking about four parts of this. Our journey doesn't end when we give our lives to Christ. And so many people think they give their life to Christ and they come to church most weeks and everything's fine and that's the way it's supposed to be. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. Because God has more for each of us. If we've given our life to Christ, or even if we haven't, God has more for every single person in this room tonight. He has more for me. There's always more that God has for us if we're just willing to listen and walk and accept what he has. And God has more for others through us. It's not just about us, but God wants to bless others through us. And that's why I always say to people, that people say, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. Although I can find no examples in the Bible of people that just didn't fellowship with other believers. But what I say, I say this when people tell me this, I've said this before. I said, okay, maybe you don't need the church. I don't believe that. But I said, okay, maybe you don't need the church, but... The church needs you. The church needs you. You have something to offer. There's never been a time that I've been in a small group that I didn't learn and grow through the presence of all the people there. Never been a time. God has more for us and to others through, uh, to others through us. For others through us. Oswald Chambers said this, God will never allow you to keep a spiritual blessing completely for yourself. It must be given back to him so that he can make it a blessing to others. If you've got a spiritual, uh, a spiritual blessing in your life, whether it's a spiritual gift or a talent or ability, God usually intends for you to give that back to others so it can be a blessing to them. That's God, part of God's plan for each one of our lives. <coughs> Lastly, when we talk about our journeys never being over, the more, that is, the more that God has for us, the more almost always happens in community. Maybe God will speak to you privately in prayer time or when you're studying your Bible or maybe driving down the road, but what he wants you to do usually, usually involves other people. It happens in community. He has plans for you and for the community of believers. And I'm not just talking about a quest church. I'm talking about the church at large, the people in the world. God has plans for you to impact the world in your community. Point number three is this. Traveling with others means that we have to be on the move ourselves. Wow. 
If you want to truly travel with others in your Christian walk, in your faith walk, it means that you need to be moving. One of the reasons you need to be moving is it's hard for Satan to hit a moving target. Right? If you're moving and doing things God wants you to do, it's hard for Satan to hit a move as you. You're progressing. You're going to new places. And it's so important that we need to be able to move ourselves. I'm going to share with you. I usually don't get deep and theological with you. I try not to do that too much, but I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to share a deep theological reflection about our faith walk. And I learned this probably 30 years ago, and it's made a big difference in my walk. And here it is. God can't steer a park car. God can't steer a park car. Now, what does that mean? It means that if, if God is calling you to do something, you need to walk by faith and begin the process of doing what you think he's calling you to do. And as you're walking through that process, he'll gently nudge you to the left or the right or straight ahead and lead you to what needs to be done. But so many people, they think God's calling them to do something, and then they don't act. They pray about it, but they don't act upon it. Let me give you a, an example. Um, let's take something that like being a small group leader. Suppose you believe that God is calling you to be a small group leader. So you pray about it and you're sure of it. So here's what you do. You say, okay, God, you're calling me to be a small group leader. On Sunday night, I'm going to prepare a lesson. And at 7 o'clock, I'm going to be ready. And I want you to send people miraculously to show up at my small group. I didn't call anybody. I didn't ask anybody. And God, I just want you to bring them in. I want you to, a couple bring, to bring the main dish. I want a dessert. I want some uh, pop. <laughs> I, I want all this stuff. And just have them come in. And then Sunday night gets there and nobody comes. But you weren't willing to walk through that. Now, could God do that? I mean, we serve a mighty, powerful God. If somebody prays about that, it happened. Miracles happen all the time. I realize it. But usually when God calls us to do something, he expects us to have movement behind what we're doing. So, let's say you wanted to lead a small group. First of all, if you've never been a small group, I would suggest you start attending a small group. Maybe that would be a, your first step. And then if, once you've attended a small group, or if you've already attended a small group, maybe you go to a small group, or you come to us and say, I'm thinking about doing a small group. Could I sit in with a, uh, maybe some mature uh, leaders and, and see how they do things, and watch how they do things for a while, be part of that small group, and, and just see what they're doing. Maybe you do that once or twice. And then after you do all that, you say, listen, sign me up. Here's what I want to teach for my small group. We put your name on the sign-up sheet, and then people come to your small group. Did God call you to do that? Yeah, it would appear so. But it also required you to move. To move. Because if you're not moving, picture this. If you're not moving and God is trying to direct you, God's just turning the steering wheel. And when I was a little kid, uh, back then, we didn't have all the locking steering wheels and things like that, and we didn't have power steering. And I remember my dad sometimes would let me get in the car, and guess what he let me do? Turn the wheel. Man, it was so hard before our power steering, and then turned the other way, and the car wasn't moving. But do you think my dad ever allowed me to steer the car while he was driving? Some of your parents did. They were more fun, but my parents did. <laughs> no. And he would say, don't ever do, you know, and my mom would Richard, you shouldn't be letting him do that. But um, that's what he did. And he would never let me if the car was going to be dangerous. God can't steer a parked car. If you think God is calling you to do something, act on it. And if he is, he'll reveal it to you. And if it's not, go bring it to pass. I love that. God can't steer a parked car. You have to be used to it. Great example of this is, is, is Exodus. And, and, and Moses is fleeing the Egyptians. And, and they're, they're, they're getting close to the Red Sea. And it looks like they're going to be trapped. And there's all these problems. And he doesn't know what to do. See, the, the Egyptians are coming. And the people of Israel are gathered around. And then Moses stops. He stops in the middle of things. And the people cry out to him. And here's what God says to him. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. I love that. Don't pray. Get up and move. Praying's great, but guess what, Moses? You have to move. They're right behind you. I'll take care of the rest. You have to move. And I talk to people, and so many times in people's lives, we can get paralyzed, can't we? Just take a small step toward what you think God is calling you to do. Just take a small step. That could be very different for different people. Maybe it's coming and talk to 
somebody on staff here. Maybe it's talk to a friend. Maybe it's just put some feelers out there that something would happen. But we have to be willing to move for God to steer us where he's going to take us. Our mission is meeting people where they are and traveling with them to where Jesus is leading. We've talked about that. Jesus met people where they were, but he never allowed them to stay there. Put a big cir circle this and put a star by this. I think this is so important. Jesus met people where they were, did a phenomenal job of that, but he had never allowed them to stay where they were. And I think as a church, that's what we need to do. Do we need to meet people where they are? Absolutely. But we can never allow anybody to stay where they are in their faith. I don't care if they have a little faith or a lot of faith, but they're a new Christian or a pre-Christian and they've been a Christian for 40 years. We can never allow people to stay where they are. We shouldn't either. Jesus didn't, so neither should we. Jesus met Matthew. And we've talked, I'm going to talk about the three stories I talked about last week. Met Matthew, the, the tax collector. He was a selfish, greedy person, and he called him to be a disciple. He had a good gig. He could make a lot of money. And Matthew left it all. He left the life that he was doing, swindling people and overcharging and things like that, to become a disciple. Jesus didn't say, hey, you can keep your job. That's fine. And just follow me on weekends. No, he said, follow me and be my disciple. And Matthew left his life of tax collecting and the swindling that he did. He was a changed person. Jesus didn't just leave him there. Jesus met a woman caught in adultery. Where she was, they were getting ready to stone her. Remember last week I talked about, it was right near the temple. It was in the temple courts in the background of the temple with all the Jewish law was behind them. And he's saying this, the Jewish law was if you get caught in adultery, you get stoned. So the Pharisees bring the woman to Jesus and they're trying to trick Jesus because he, they know he loves people. And what's he going to do with this woman? And he said, hey, if you're without a sin, throw the first stone. Nobody threw a stone. And he just didn't say to the woman, hey, you got off easy this time. Have a good day. Watch, you know, watch it. He says this to the woman. He looks at it as the crowd dissipates and they leave. He says this to the woman caught in adultery. Go and sin no more. Don't do what you're doing. I'm not going to allow you to stay there. I love you. I just saved your life. But I'm not going to allow you to stay, stay in this life of sin. Because here I'm going to save your spiritual life as well. What do you think happened to that woman caught in adultery after Jesus saved her life? I bet she did. I bet she, I bet she left that relationship. And I bet she was a changed woman because Jesus didn't allow her to stay. And then finally, third and finally, we talked about uh, this late lady last uh, week too. Jesus met a despised, despised Samaritan woman where she was. And all her life was so dramatically changed that she immediately brought others to Christ. She was despised because Jewish people despise Samaritans. Samaritans despise Jewish people. And she was despised. She had been married many, many times. She was living somebody, which was scandalous then. It was totally, you just didn't do that. That was just scandalous back then. Nobody did that, and she was doing it. And yet he meets her in such a way that she leaves the, 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 the Gospel of John tells us, the book of John tells us, she left her water pitcher there. When she came to get water, and she goes running back to tell the town, this guy could be, I think this guy's the Messiah. And we're told, because of the woman's testimony, because her life is so immediately changed, because of her uh, testimony, many people in the town followed this Jewish Messiah. The Jewish, not supposed to like Jews, but the Samaritans came to Christ because of her testimony. Jesus changed her life. You think she still lived with the person she was living with? I don't think so. Jesus never allowed people to stay where they are. He met them where they were, but he didn't allow them to stay there. <clears throat> See, we can be an attraction church that continually welcomes people and meets them where they are uh, by making this uh, place warm and, and fun and inviting and comfortable. We can do all those things, but if we don't, uh, uh, take help, uh, don't, don't take or help people go where Jesus is leading, then we may as well be Disney World. Right? I love Disney World. You guys ever been to Disney World? I love it, but it doesn't change me. And if we're doing all the warm fuzzies and doing those things and we don't change people's lives, what have we done? You'd be better off at Disney World because we've been ashamed and we didn't do what Christ called us to do. Go and make disciples. 
And I'll be very honest with you. We do, I think, a really good job of attracting people and making them feel warm and welcome and invited and safe. We really do. But we need to do, and I need to do, this church needs to do a better job of taking people where Jesus is leading. And uh, we're still looking. We're coming down the home stretch. Hopefully in a month we might have an announcement. We're still looking to hire a pastor of connections and a pastor of discipleship or director of connections and, and discipleship to help us do this because we've just gotten overloaded. But there's so much more that we need to be doing with small groups and with classes and with discipleship because we can't let people stay where they are. You know, I went to church for 15 years. And I grew a little bit, but I really pretty much stayed where I got more knowledge, but I stayed where I was. And then one night when I was 15 years old, it was the summer between my freshman and sophomore years of high school, I went to a spaghetti dinner hosted by a church, and I gave my life to Christ. And things began to change. And it wasn't one just glorious rise. And I mean, I had some rough years in there, especially through college in my early 20s. But because of other people who came alongside me and discipled me, they didn't let me stay where I was. And that's what we need to do as a church. Yeah, love people, absolutely. Make them feel at home, yes, absolutely. Do those things, have great coffee, have a nice warm spot, do hospitality. But we need to take them where Christ is leading or we haven't done our job as a church. Jesus always did it, we need to do it too. People influencing others for Christ are themselves being influenced by Christ. Whenever I see people influencing others for Christ, whether it's teaching a small group or having a conversation with a friend or a neighbor, or if you're a mother or a father and you have a son or a daughter at home, no matter what it is, maybe it's a fellow student at school, somebody you work with, people influencing others for Christ themselves are being influenced by Christ. If you want to disciple others, you need to start by being discipled yourselves. And I need to do the same. And the times when I'm discipling myself and, and having other people and come together and, and learning and seeking to grow, it makes a huge difference in my life and my ability to be used by God to affect and influence others. See, we should both disciple others, disciple others and be discipled by others. We should be being disciples ourselves, and we should be discipling others all the time. Just heard about a group that's being in our church. It's full. It's a, a group of five. Uh, they're gonna, it's an accountability group, and those need to say small. They're not a small group. It's an accountability group, and five men came together in our church, and they're going to meet weekly for a while. I don't know how long, and they're going to share with each other, and they're going to hold each other accountable. Great things are going to happen because of what those five guys are going to do. These are five normal, good guys, fun to hang out with. Um, just good men, and they're just getting together to share. And I was talking to one of the men there earlier, and uh, I said, you know, I was so glad he jumped into that group. Somebody invited him, and I've been talking to him. I said, man, this is great, because I was in a group like that, and one of the first things I learned was other men struggle too. And not all men are these super Christians I thought they were. Because I thought I was, something was wrong with me because I'd struggled with things in life and I knew I wasn't where God wanted me. And then I'd hear those stories. And it helped me feel okay about myself, but I was challenged, though, to continue to grow in Christ. And being in a small group and being in an accountability group and being able to go back to Prospect United Church, uh, Methodist Church in Cincinnati made a huge difference in my life. And guess what? I, I still meet with two other pastors that I went to seminary with and we hold each other accountable. One of them lost his father this week in Texas. And I was on the phone two or three times talking to him and praying for him and just uh, being there for him. It's so important. So we need to both disciple others and be discipled by others. Point number five is this. Life events can affect our journeys. Life events can affect our journeys. Let me ask you a question. How many people in this room have experienced a, uh, a traumatic event? <coughs> Something terrible has happened to you. Maybe you've lost a, a father or a mother or a sibling or a son or a daughter or somebody close to you, a good friend. How many of you have had that happen in your lives? Wow. Over here. Why are you still here? Some people that happens to and they, and they blame God and they never come back to church. Other people stick around. What's the difference? 
I love what Francis Chan said. And uh, you talk about being a disciple. This quote, somebody in our, um, we meet for prayer on every Tuesday, and uh, this lady did this devotional, and she shared this quote. Man, it went right to my heart. Here it is, and I'm sharing it with you. I got disciple Tuesday in prayer. I never heard this before. You can define your life by what you go through or by who you belong to. And everybody else, oh, that's good, but man, that quote just went right. I thought, wow. Man, that is so true. You can define your life by what you go through or by who you belong to. Because being a Christian doesn't guarantee you're going to have a rosy life. You're not. By who you belong to or by what you go through. Man, I love that. Point number six, as we continue and we kind of begin to wrap things up here, there are really four journey questions we need to ask ourselves. You can write all four of these down, or if some one or two of them speak to you, go ahead and write that down. But, but here's the first one. Four questions that we really need to examine as we look at where we are on the journey. And the first one is this. Am I traveling with others? Am I traveling with others? It could be a friend you talk to that's a Christian. We always push small groups. It could be a small group. It could be an accountability. It could be a class. But you need to come together with other people and travel with them. So am I traveling with others? Jesus often went, to, went away to lonely places and prayed. He did that, absolutely. But virtually every other part of his ministry was done publicly. He preached publicly. He healed usually publicly. He fed the, the, the 5,000 publicly. He went on the cross publicly. He rose from the dead and he appeared to the disciples and many other people publicly. He ascended back into the heaven publicly. And then people tell me my faith is a private matter. No, it's not. Your faith is a personal matter, but it's not private. Your faith is personal, but it's not private. We're there for each other, and we need to do that in community. That's so important. So number one, am I, am I traveling with others? Question number two that we need to ask as we continue and look at our journeys is this. Is my journey affecting others on their journey with Christ? You don't have to be a great teacher or a preacher, but are there people in your life that are seeing a difference that you are affecting on their journey? Maybe they're pre maybe they've never given their lives to Christ. Maybe they're going through a tough area in their, in their lives right now. Maybe they're mature Christians, but you just challenge each other. My accountability partners, man, we call each other out. We can do that. You, know, you ever be called out by a, an accountability partner? We do that. Don't do it a lot, but those guys, if I'm making a mistake or have done something I shouldn't have done, we call each other out. We call each other out. So is my journey affecting others on their journey with Christ? Could be just one person. Could be just one person. I want to stop right now and say if you're a young mother and you think you're not affecting other people for Christ, just affect your, your child. Just love them every time you change their diaper, pray for their future. Uh, maybe every third diaper you, you change, maybe pray for a godly spouse for them. You know? You're making a huge difference. And so many times, it's so important. Or, or a father, if you're a stay-at-home father, it doesn't matter. It, just being with your child and doing those things and loving them is so important in the kingdom. Satan hates what you're doing. He hates that you love your child. He hates that you love your husband. He hates what you're doing. So just, just hang in there until you can get through, you know, through those times. But are we doing those things that will attract others on their journey with Christ? Third question is this. Does my journey with Christ challenge, invigorate, and excite me? Man. Does my journey with Christ challenge, invigorate, and excite me? And I know there's some times on our journeys where we slow down and take a break and maybe take a pause, but that should just be temporary. And, and, and that sometimes happens. I'm going to mention this. If you come, maybe you've been in another church and you haven't been in church for a while or you just got done just being burnt out in another church, if you want to just come here and hang out for a while, it's okay to do that for a season. And we see that happen so many times. People come and they get burned out in another church and they come here and it usually take them, takes them from three months to 15 months to jump in and get involved. That's okay. Don't feel guilty about it. And some people come here and they get healed and they move on, and that's great too, as long as they go to another church. That's okay. It's okay to pause. That's okay. But overall, is your journey challenging you, invigorating you, and exciting you? 
You know, I've told this before. A lot of my friends are starting to retire now. Most of them, in fact, are, are retired, you know. And I'm like, man, no, I've, I want to keep doing this for a while. This is really cool stuff. It invigorates, it excites me, it challenges me. It, it keeps me young, you know. I, I want to do this. This is what I want to do. And uh, even if I could retire right now, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. We love, Mary and I love what we're doing. But if we look at that question, does my uh, journey with Christ chat is bigger and exciting? Well, let, let's, let's look at an announcement for next week. Here, here's a special announcement, okay? Jesus Christ, if I was at this, Jesus Christ will be at Quest next Sunday. Invite your friends. Wow. Is that exciting? You don't act exciting. Is that exciting? You think it's funny, but it should be exciting. But it might happen. You guys don't think he's going to show up? Well, let's look at this. I'll prove that he's coming because... Deuteronomy says the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or, nor you forsake you. So if God never leaves you, if you come to church, Christ is with us. And secondly, this is even stronger. Jesus says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among you. One, two, three. We have at least three here. Jesus is present. He's here tonight. And we don't get excited and celebrate that. It's great worship. What a privilege it is to be up here and to talk to you guys about Jesus Christ. This stuff should excite us. And it should excite us in a way that we want to tell others. You know, that that's what it should do. And then uh, fourth and finally, fourth question is this. What is one thing I can do to change the nature or the direction of my journey that will impact the journey of others? Why don't you pick one thing? You pick two, that's fine. We won't penalize you. Mm -hmm. But think about that. Before you leave tonight or maybe this week, circle that and just think, what is one thing I could do to change the nature or the direction of my journey that will impact the journey of others? You know, as soon as I said that, some of you know what it is right away. Some of you should go home and pray about it and see. But what's the one thing I can do? What is it? And our prayer should be this, God, just reveal it to me. But before you ask that, say, God, no matter what it is, I'll be willing to do it. And then say, God, reveal to me. And then see what happens. You know, this is an exciting week. We're starting our capital campaign. The pre-campaign starts tomorrow here with our stakeholders meeting. That's going to be exciting. And uh, tomorrow we commission people again for the Lake Campus. And next Sunday, our new work starts at Indian Lake, our new journey. And this is the most exciting time in the history of Quest. Even, even I think, more exciting than we launched with 21 people nine years ago. These are exciting times. God has blessed us. He continues to come alongside of us. It's so humbling, it just blows me away. But I think these are the most exciting times that we've ever experienced. And you know when I'll leave this church? I'll probably leave when we start talking about the good old days. I don't know it's my time to go because I really fully believe our good old days, our best days, are yet to come. And I hope you believe that too. Because we're all on a journey and God's got big plans, not only for this church, but for every one of us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are on a journey with you. And we would just ask that you would just come. Just lead us into those things that we need to do to affect others on their journey. Father, reveal your truth in our lives in new and exciting ways. Father, give us a fire in our belly for you and the gospel and the kingdom. Allow us, Father, to be your empty pipes, your conduits, to be used to affect the kingdom. We love you. We love you, Jesus Christ. Just do these things. Come and do these things in our lives. We praise your mighty name and say, Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing song.